All right, guys, let's get started. So today we're going to continue our discussion of isolation. And uh, we're going to look at this paper uh, called RL Box, which is looking at this problem of library sandboxing. So what's the problem these guys are trying to solve? Um, these guys are worried about browser security. And we haven't really talked very much about what goes on a web browser. But at the level these guys are concerned about, they're really concerned about just buggy C code having buffer overflows in the browser, roughly speaking. So the particular setting for them is they're actually working with some folks from Firefox, which is a reasonably popular browser. And Firefox actually makes use of a whole bunch of libraries for decoding various formats. So there's many images, image formats that you might have to decode, even fairly unpopular image formats that some web pages use, Firefox still has to support. And the code for that format decoder might be quite old and not very well maintained. Same for various video formats, various font definitions, what have you. There's a lot of different file formats and data formats and transformations the browser has to support. These all come from third-party libraries. The browser developers aren't writing themselves. They're getting from someone else. It's written a PNG render, a viewer decoder, JPEG decoder, what have you. And, of course, they're worried, as the story is in this class for the most part, about these libraries being buggy. And as a result, if there's a bug in the library, you can actually compromise the browser. So this would be really bad for them because uh, adversaries could just take over your browser and uh, run off with whatever data you have in the browser, elsewhere, etc. So the goal for them is to really isolate these libraries from the rest of the browser, the rest of the application and do so in a safe way. So at some level, the story should look pretty familiar by now. Hopefully you're, to some extent, maybe even getting tired of papers about isolation. That's half of what security is all about. Uh, but there's a couple of new things here in this paper that are worth paying attention to. So one difference is that we've talked a lot about isolation mechanisms already. Processes, VMs, WebAssembly, what have you. This paper isn't really doing anything new at the isolation level. They're just using all the mechanisms we already talked about. They're using processes as one option. They're using WebAssembly as the other option. WebAssembly is what they use in Firefox for real in the deployed version. They're using native client, which is a thing that existed before WebAssembly. So in terms of isolation, there's not a whole lot new going on here. What's really going on new here is interface security. as opposed to just isolation. So we'll dive into these examples in a bit, but roughly speaking, they assume isolation is a perfectly good working black box. You can put code in a box and run it with isolation. The problem that they're addressing shows up at the boundary when you start interacting with this isolated code in a box. How do you do so safely without accidentally trusting what's coming out of the box too much? So this is a big deal in this paper. That's why we're reading it for the most part. The second sort of maybe second order new thing that's interesting to look at here in this paper is this idea of privilege separation that we've seen over and over again. Here we're finally seeing in client-side software. So, so far we've been quite heavily talking about what happens on servers. So we had, you know, OKWS isolating code in a web server, Google isolating code in web servers, all these other technologies all about server security. And here we're finally coming to similar ideas showing up in code that would typically run on your client-side device in your web browser. And we'll see sort of this idea of privilege separation showing up in all kinds of contexts. That's sort of the first time we're seeing it here. Make sense? Questions about what's going on in this paper? Anything high level so far? All right. So maybe as one bit of background to try to start this discussion, let's talk about what a web browser looks like internally. And this is sort of more on the client-side privilege separation story. What does a browser look like already? What degrees of privilege separation does a browser have? And what more are these guys adding to a browser 
in their design. So what does a browser look like? So sort of historically, of course, browsers started as being fairly monolithic entities where you would just have a web browser running as a separate single process on your machine, so fairly monolithic. And the browser is responsible for running many different web pages that you're viewing. So pages A, B, C, whatever, are all things that the web browser is running inside of it, and ideally you would isolate from each other and from the underlying host system. So this monolithic design was, of course, the initial design that the web browser developers cooked up, wasn't so good at preventing malicious code in the web page from indeed triggering some bug in the browser and escaping and corrupting your whole host machine. So these days, uh, the architecture looks a little bit better than this, and the browser vendors, probably about a decade ago, uh, refactored their browsers to, into two parts. There's the renderer process that's actually running the web page, and some kind of a browser kernel or core that is responsible for interacting with your local system storing files, storing data, the cache, the history, etc. So the architecture of a typical browser these days looks more like this, where you have a process called a renderer, whose job is to draw every window you have. And you're probably going to have a separate renderer process for every window, maybe for every tab, depend exact, depends exactly on the settings. And these guys interact with some sort of a browser kernel or core, and the job of this guy, you can sort of think of it, this is like the DB proxy from OKWS. This thing is storing all the state that the browser cares about, and these processes are just running and viewing your web pages for you. They're all actually going to run still the same pages. You know, all the different sites you might visit, ABC, they're all going to be running in the same renderer process. But what's new in this architecture that browsers typically run with separate renders is that every renderer process is isolated from the underlying host operating system. So they use things like seccomp and maybe user IDs and other techniques to make sure that if the renderer process is compromised, it can't actually directly access files in your machine. It's living in its own little OS jail of, of sorts. And the only thing it can do, roughly speaking, is talk to the browser kernel to access you know, cookies, browser history, etc. So the focus of this render design is largely on sort of limiting the damage to the underlying OS. So if someone compromises your browser by sending you a web page that triggers a bug in this renderer process, well, kind of too bad for this renderer process and all the websites that you visited, but at least your underlying machine maybe is secure. So maybe they're not stealing files from your machine. It used to be a pretty important property back when you used to have lots of other stuff on your machine. These days, a lot of stuff lives in the browser, so it's not quite, well, you know, it, it's useful to, I guess, protect the underlying machine from buggy browsers, but it's not a, quite enough in practice because you really care now about isolating different websites from each other. So if one website loads some buggy JavaScript or uh, JPEG files, I guess, in the context of this paper, or fonts, and triggers a bug here, this renderer design isn't itself preventing different sites from corrupting each other. That make sense? Questions about how browsers look today? This is pretty common. I think Firefox and Chrome kind of look like this. There's one sort of recent development in browser architectures where I think Chrome is doing something called site isolation, where they're actually trying to map the different websites that you might visit, like A, B, and C, maybe this is like Gmail, MIT.edu, Facebook, what have you, onto different processes. So trying to align the different web applications you're visiting with different isolation domains on your client device. So the idea with site isolation is that you might actually have one rendering process for maybe gmail.com, and then you would have another rendering process for MIT.edu. And then they still, of course, talk to the same browser core to access their shared state, browser history, cookies, etc. cetera. 
So one question is, okay, so, so this, this provides you some nice property, which is that if you trigger a bug in this renderer, not only can't you escape to the operating system because this thing is sandboxed in its own little process, but also it only has access to the state of its own domain. So if you trigger a bug here, you only affect that particular web application. So why is this not good enough for these guys? Why are they pushing for more isolation? What are they worried about? Yeah? Yes, okay, so your point is, yeah, you might compromise something inside of here, but it wasn't all of Gmail, but this elevates the compromise. So one example in Gmail might be, I send you a JPEG image with an attachment. You're going to view it in Gmail. You're going to view it in this process. Gmail was totally uncompromised before this, but you view this email attachment I sent you in the Gmail rendering process. That runs the J JPEG render this process. If that has a buffer overflow that my image triggers, then all of a sudden... The adversary gets to run code in this process and take over your whole Gmail account now. So this seems kind of problematic from their perspective. They're thinking that, you know, it's not really Gmail's fault that it accidentally sort of rendered some uh, image that was supplied by an adversary. And they have some evaluation in the paper that shows actually many applications do this. So you might load fonts from another domain. You might load images from some CDN, from some popular other site, etc. So it's fairly common to uh, not have total control of all the data you're serving into your web application domain, so to say. That make sense? So these guys want to do better than the site isolation plan, and their plan is to sandbox the codex. So the idea is that we're going to have that renderer process. It might be with site isolation or might be the rendering process from this design, doesn't really matter. But the plan is, we're going to have a separate box for every codec, like the JPEG decoder is going to live in a separate box inside here, and you know the MP4 video decoder is going to be in another isolation domain, and so on. So now, if you trigger a bug there, it's not going to affect the rest of the process. So one question you might have is, why are they so excited about codecs? I guess one thing we talked about is uh, there's a lot of them, and they might be poorly written or maybe not the best pieces of code in the browser, just because they might be historic codecs that you have to support, but no one is excited about maintaining or rewriting that library cleanly. But sort of from a perspective of why it's actually a good idea to sandbox a codec, one thing that's really going for a codec is that it has actually a pretty clean specification or a clean abstraction of what it's providing. It's not like some complicated thing where there's a lot of state going on. In a codec, typically you feed some data in, it processes it, either compresses, decompresses, decodes, whatever, and puts data out. So it's a very simple data processing pipeline. It's stateless, for example. There's no data stored in the codec itself for the most part after you've finished processing some image. It's fairly independent image to image. Um, the interface is pretty clean. There's sort of data coming in, data coming out. So I guess one way to say, say it, it's a fairly a functional piece of code in the sense of almost like a functional programming language. You just run on an input, produces an output. That's it. And the other nice thing about codecs is that typically there is an expectation that a decoding or processing step might actually fail. So at least at a high level, it's actually pretty clear that there's a way to handle errors. So if one of these boxes hits a bug, like a buffer overflow, the browser isn't going to be scratching its head. What do I do? All the code that interacts with the codec probably is written with the expectation that, oh, it might fail. So we can turn any bug into a failure of the codec, and the browser is just going to keep running. So codecs present a really you know, a nice opportunity to really box up the decoder and make the rest of the browser work just better without having to really change much of the rest of the browser. Just improve the codec locally with sandboxing, isolation. Does that make sense? So, so codecs are a pretty good opportunity here for sandboxing. Yeah? Is that a diagram? Or is each box a new process? Uh, in the, this diagram? Or? In all of them. Yeah. So 
the outer boxes I've been drawing for like the rendering and the core here. So let me talk about like this guy, right? So this rendering box, and this browser kernel, and this rendering box, these are processes. So, so browsers at the browser architecture level, these guys use big processes, absolutely. And then they, these are great. on Linux, for example, they'd set a seccom BPF policy underneath of this process, etc. So these are processes. These guys inside of here for this paper sandboxing plan are kind of anything you want them to be. They actually have different plans in the paper they explore. Sometimes they use, make these boxes out of processes. So I guess then they, should, they would be sort of outside. Sometimes they actually use WebAssembly to run them. So then they're kind of inside this process, but they're still isolated, boxed with WebAssembly like we talked about last lecture. So, yeah. And then these boxes for the websites A, B, and C, they're nothing. They're not actually isolation domains at all. I'm just showing that the browser is sort of in charge of boxing up the website, but it's not a crisp process or WebAssembly boundary. It's the browser's problem, and it's kind of a messy thing we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Make sense? Other questions? All right. So that's the plan. They're going to try to figure out how to sandbox these codecs in the browser. One interesting thing to actually think about is the paper talks about is, uh, you know, how many sandboxes are we going to need to make this work well? <laughs> sort of a legitimate question, I suppose. Like, you know, at what point have you sandboxed enough? So one design, of course, right, is you might imagine that we're going to take the renderer and offload all the codecs into a separate process. So there's just two processes, the renderer process and the codec process. So very coarse grained. Actually, uh, Firefox experimented with this. They had a design like this called the Gecko Media Process, I think, where they actually stuck in the, they tried actually putting all the codecs into a separate process. Um, why aren't these guys happy enough with this codec plan uh, where everything is in the same sandbox? Sort of gives them some benefit, right? Because in this separate, separation design, if I trigger a bug in, let's say, the JPEG library here or the MP4 library, then the render process is not affected. Why are they, why is there more to say? Why is this not enough for them? Yeah? Yeah, good point. Yeah, so I think you, you put it right. It's like the weakest library here matters, and it undermines the security of all of them. So the I think most compelling example of the paper they have is actually one of the codecs you might want to put in here is Zlib that's used for compressing data over the network. And, you know, indeed, it's a codec. It looks very functional, so it fits this pattern. It would be a great thing to put in a box. But if you put it in a box with other buggy code, then anything that is used is using Zlib to decompress itself, like you're sending compressed JavaScript to a web page, well, it goes through this sandbox process going through Zlib. It's been compromised by a buggy JPEG decoder. What this means now is that the buggy JPEG decoder can take over the Zlib decoder and incorrectly decompress JavaScript. So you thought, ah, the buggy JPEG just misrenders the JPEG image. But now it can take over Zlib and corrupt your JavaScript and ins insert arbitrary JavaScript. Or same for, you know, compressed WebAssembly. If there's WebAssembly going into your web page that's supposed to run there, well, this JPEG guy can now take over your WASM code and inject arbitrary code that way. So you really want to keep this stuff more uh, fine-grained, isolated, to avoid these kinds of weakest... Uh, library problems, so to say. Because even though these codecs sort of don't matter in some ways, they sort of do, right? So, you know, you, you do want to get the right Zlib data, even for these other codecs, you, for the font, for example, you do kind of want to get the right font, otherwise the adversary can corrupt what you're seeing on the screen and confuse you into tricking, uh, into clicking on the wrong link, for example. So it is important to, for these things to kind of work to the extent they can. So they'd like to do more. And one reason, actually, why they're actually able to do more is precisely because of WebAssembly. The reason they started out with this design was that isolation was pretty expensive, and this was the only isolation technology available to do a process. 
And when WebAssembly came around and uh, native client, it actually reduced the cost of doing isolated boxes by quite a bit. So they're able to now do many more separate isolation domains than you would have been able to do without WebAssembly. Now, they don't do sort of the extreme end, right? So, so just to spell out, right? So the extreme version would be one sandbox per invocation. Meaning that every time I want to decode anything, I start a new sandbox with the right decoder, feed it in, decode, kill the sandbox. So that would be ideal. There's just no way there's anything corrupted across files. And maybe this will be possible eventually if the WebAssembly guys, you know, reduce the overheads even further. But for the purpose of this paper, these guys say, ah, you know, it's still kind of expensive. Still, it takes a couple of milliseconds to start a WebAssembly box. If you have 100 JPEG images, that's 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. You know, not so great. So they actually amortize it. So in their design, what they do is really sort of create one sandbox that's reused for every sort of tuple of render and uh, origin. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of stuff they put in this tuple. The origin of where the content is coming from, the library that you're running, and the type of content that you're trying to render. So the reason this works well for them is that for most of the sort of trust domains that you might care about, this ensures that data is isolated from uh, differently trusted data. So for example, if you have JavaScript code you're trying to decompress here, that's one content type, that'll use one sandbox, versus all the other data you might be trying to decompress with Zlib, that'll be a different sandbox because it's a different content type, perhaps. And then, of course, different libraries aren't going to share between each other. Data coming from different origins isn't going to be shared, etc. So that's their sort of trade-off that seems like a reasonable design. It gives them a lot of benefit because for exactly the use case where you have 100 JPEGs coming in all at once, they get to share the sandbox. But they're all sort of equally trusted, or in many cases, seems to be okay. It seems to be an all right trade-off for them and gets them pretty good performance. That sort of makes sense? Questions about this sandbox sharing plan they have? Questions about anything else? Feel free to ask questions through Richard anonymously as well. All right. So let's try to understand what's actually technically difficult about this. So the technical challenge that they are trying to address is really the interface between the application and this library code. So the picture you could have in mind is that before before any sandboxing takes place, the application and the library are written together in the same process, and they invoke each other, and they share data, and they have pointers to the same shared data in the same application. That sort of makes sense? So you have application code running, library code is running right there in the same process. You can just call from the application to the library. The library might call the application with some callback. They have shared data. They all access it. It's all easy to program. And this is the mental model that both the app developer and the library developer have in mind. And where these guys are trying to shift to is a very different world, at least in terms of these diagrams, where we're going to have the app running in one box, and then we're going to have the library running a different box, and they're going to very explicitly interact through some kind of calls across this protection boundary. And the question for them is, what do you do at this boundary level? How do you make sure that the application is secure even the, now that we've split it up into two parts? And there's many ways this could potentially go wrong. So one is that maybe the application is going to trust the results from the, from the library. So we'll look at some examples from their paper. One nice thing about the paper is they have fairly concrete real-world examples that they talk about. But in general, one problem might be that sort of on this return arrow, the library is going to send some data back to the application. And the application was written sort of expecting libraries, part of the trusted computing base. There's no reason to distrust the library. But if our goal is to actually have the library 
work here and not compromise the app, even if the library is bad, we can't really blindly trust the data coming back from the library. We need to examine it carefully. Another problem might be that on the sending side, when the application calls the library or sends some data there, it actually might accidentally reveal some secrets. So maybe you can actually send some sensitive data that shouldn't have been sent. These are sort of broadly the kinds of issues they're worried about. And you can imagine, these are issues regardless of how you draw these box boundaries. So it's not an isolation problem. Both the app and the library are correctly isolated. And the problem we're talking about is how do we make sure that they securely interact with one another, so they implement sharing securely. Isolation is done. It's all about securing this interaction. And there are sort of two things going on in this paper that are uniquely making their job more difficult. One is that this is an existing API. So they're not designing this interface between the app and the library from scratch. They're taking some library off the shelf. Some developer of libjpeg 20 years ago decided, oh, this would be a nice set of functions to expose. They weren't really thinking of this as a security boundary. And now, all of a sudden, they have to provide security checks at the level of this API that wasn't really intended to be a security layer to begin with. So that's one set of challenges for them. The other challenge that they struggle with is the fact that they're operating or coming from a shared memory environment. So the initial interaction between the app and the library that they're starting from often involves the app and the library sharing pointers to the same set of data in the process. Pretty natural way to interact with the library. But if you split them up, now you don't actually have shared memory between the app and the library. You want to clearly delineate the state between them. And uh, trying to protect the app and the library from each other when they're sort of expecting to have shared memory turns out to be a messy proposition. Make sense? Questions about this problem they're going for? Yeah. Ah, so yeah, okay, so question back on this board. So um, with this kind of amortization plan, if you have web pages coming from different origins, this origin would probably be different, so that means that they would create a separate sandbox for JPEG images from MIT.edu versus JPEG images coming from gmail.com. So this origin would be the domain, roughly speaking, of where the data is coming from. And similarly, if you're running from a different renderer process, that would also be a different sandbox, same as with a different library. libjpeg, JPEG images from MIT would be subject to a different sandbox than PNG images using a different library there. Hopefully it clarifies that question. All right, other questions? Yeah. So remote, so your question is like, what's the relation between remote browser isolation plans? So remote browser, you're thinking like some data center is running the browser on your behalf, like what Amazon Kindle used to do. Yeah. So I think in that case, the thing that gets compromised is the browser running in Amazon's data center instead of on your computer. So you get this level of isolation to some degree for free. So pre previously, you would worry about the browser bugs compromising your machine. If this browser is running in some data center instead of your machine and you're just remotely viewing it, then your OS can't possibly be compromised. So you sort of get this renderer design for free. You don't need to split it up into renderers. But the problem you still have is if your browser is running remotely, well, it does have your cookies for all the different sites. So if it gets compromised, the browser on the cloud, on the server, can reveal the cookies for all your sites you're logged into to the attacker. And the same as this problem, even if it's site isolated, if you're viewing you know, my malicious attachment in your Gmail remote browser, if I take over your browser process on the server, I'll steal your Gmail cookie as a result. So all the same problems apply about the only difference is what underlying OS are you going to compromise if you escape the browser altogether? Other questions? All right. So the next thing I wanted to go through with you guys is actually the various examples, sort of illustrative to understand, kind of a weird security problem to wrap your head around initially at this API boundary. It sort of feels like WebAssembly, we should be done. We've isolated it up. So let's look at 
various examples of how this interface security problem could go wrong to get us to sort of understand what they're struggling with. And then we'll talk about the C++ template hack they came up with, roughly speaking, to try to address this problem. So the first example they have is uh, sanitizing data. So the thing they're imagining is that we got our library and the application running next to each other, and the application calls into the library saying, you know, please decode this chunk of JPEG images, and the library might call back to the application and say, oh yeah, you know, I, I wanna, you know, I process that data, please skip ahead by n bytes. So this is the real example they had in their paper where the libjpeg has a way to tell the application, I want you to give me data starting from n bytes further in the input file. Because the JPEG library is just implementing the codec. LibJPEG isn't assuming that the data is in a file or coming from the network, etc. The application is sort of providing the data stream for libjpeg, the library codec here. So this value n might be arbitrary if we're thinking the library is compromised. So immediately you probably are thinking, you know, what if, you know, if a compromised library is running, then it might actually say n is something crazy, like 2 to the 31, or 2 to the, I don't know, 63, 63, I guess, etc. So like some gigantic value that's going to overflow whatever buffer that the application is using to track the data for this codec. So, of course, what we need to do is somehow check this value that we're getting from the library before we start using it in the application. And you can imagine lots of checks, right? So you might bounce check it, say that, ah, if the library is asking me to skip n bytes of data from the input, well, let me just check if it's more than the number of bytes I have total available, etc. So fairly simple checks, but you, the application might not have that check yet because it wasn't really written with a security mindset against the library to begin with, and this existing API didn't force it on the application developers. Another example they have in the paper is similarly, you know, the app and libjpeg are interacting with each other, and the application calls into libjpeg, and the library returns some kind of a status code. And the application might be expecting that there's, I don't know, like three different kinds of status you can have. You're done rendering, you're skipping ahead, or there's an error. And it's encoded in some kind of a 32-bit integer. So maybe there's a status int, and the application only handles three cases because that's all that the library should be returning, only three possible values legit for this int value. But of course, the library is compromised, then could return any integer value and confuse the application, and the application might not properly handle this extra case. So again, we need to check for validity of the status here to make sure that it's one of the allowed three kinds of status values, for instance. So that's one example of how you might need, w want to worry about the sanitization of data coming from the library back into the application. Make sense? Questions about sanitizing data? Hopefully it makes some sense. All right, so the other example that they have is dealing with pointers. So of course, the starting point for us was, as I was drawing over here, that the application just has shared memory with the library. So the application could easily allocate a block of memory in its local address space and then invoke the library on the pointer. So you might call you know, f on some function from the library on this pointer p, and the library might try to access it. And then the library might allocate some result and give it back to the application. Like P might be the input JPEG image. This is the decoded image. Well, if we're going to box these up, the pointers aren't going to work at all, right? So if the app and the library are in their own sandboxes, then the library can't access pointers from the host machine. If the library is in a different process or inside of a WebAssembly sandbox, this pointer from the app is meaningless. Can't really access it. And same for the other way around. The application can't really access the result the library allocated over here in its sandbox. So we need to get this right. And there's sort of a 
set of two different things going on here with RLbox, what they're trying to fix. One is they're just trying to make the developer experience tolerable. They, they want to get the developer to uh, be able to easily uh, fix the interface to marshal the data across the boundary. I guess one thing I should say is like the, the obvious answer is that we have to actually copy the data. So it's not sufficient to pass a pointer. So if the API was decode a JPEG at this pointer, here's some input bytes. You now have to send the bytes over to the memory of the library process and then ask it to decode those bytes. So you have to make the data copied between and same for the result going back. And so the first order thing that RLbox is helping with is just helping the developers catch the places where this needs to happen. So the developer actually does this instead of having to catch it all in testing. But then there's a sort of a second order effect which is that, you know, of course you can try to catch this in testing, and for the most part, the application is probably just going to break. If you're not copying the data, you're sending a meaningless pointer over here, it's going to access it, it's going to crash because this pointer is nonsense in the sandbox. Same thing on the result. It's a meaningless pointer back in the application. So does that make sense? All right, so for the most part, I think you'll catch a bunch of these cases in testing, but, you know, if there's some exception, like there's some rarely accessed pointer, you send it over to the library, but typically it's not needed, so the library doesn't bother accessing it, you don't find it, or if the library sends some pointer back to the application, but typically it's not used, but if some error happens, the application does use the pointer, then all of a sudden you have problems. So if you have some pointers that are sort of being sent back and forth that you forgot to, uh, you know, appropriately handle by copying the data, the paper argues there are sort of two interesting problems that could arise. If you're sending pointers from the application to the library, you might be accidentally revealing your address space randomization. So if you remember from the baggy bounds paper, a pretty common defense, or from that lecture, a pretty common defense for buffer overflows is to randomize the layout of memory in your address space. It makes it much more difficult to exploit buffer overflows. But if the application accidentally sends some pointer of its own address space over to the library, then the library will be able to figure out how the address space of the application might be randomized. That's like not a total disaster, but might now make it easier for the adversary to exploit some subsequent buffer flow in the application. So ideally, we wouldn't leak this stuff. That makes sense? This is not a huge disaster, but undesirable. In the other direction, could be more problematic. So suppose that the library sends a pointer back to the application. And in, t in testing, we didn't catch this because, ah, you know, it's some corner case that doesn't happen all that often. But if the adversary can cause that to happen and the application all of a sudden, let's say, writes to that pointer, then the library is now in a position where it can give a pointer to the application, a pointer to the application's own memory, and the application will write to that address chosen by the library. So that's now pretty damaging. So it's really bad if we forget to uh, unwrap some pointer sent from the library to the application, because that might now be arbitrary memory rights. Does that make sense? Why this could be a big problem for us? All right, hopefully it makes some sense. So these are real issues. So these guys, I guess, were converting quite a number of libraries in uh, Firefox, ran into all these uh, sort of corner cases, having to convert the library to have this interface uh, between uh, the renderer and the codec. Another example that I want to talk about that the paper points out is sort of a, maybe a more subtle issue, which is race conditions between the application and the codec library. So here's an interesting example to keep in mind if you're designing interfaces, races, or what the paper calls double fetch bugs. So the problem here is that we have some application, and again we have our library, and the library allocates some result for us to look at. So maybe there's some structure, Here's some result that the library allocated and sends us a pointer back to this result. So there might be lots of, like the result might be a struct with a bunch of fields, who knows what the result is. 
And the application might now try to actually follow, try to address the problems we have on those right boards, and actually might want to check that the result looks good before using it. Like make sure the result values are in bounds. So maybe the application first, it'll sort of, you know, fetch the value from this pointer, fetch the value and check it that it's actually a valid pointer or a valid offset, count n, valid status code, whatever it is. And then after we've checked that it looks good, then we'll just, you know, continue and later in the code we'll fetch it and actually use the value. The problem now, of course, is that because we've done the fetch twice, there's nothing that guarantees that this fetch will return the same value that we've checked in step one. So if we have the sandbox running here in the middle, then the adversarial sandbox can actually change the memory contents. So we've checked, let's say, some point offset n in this step. Then the adversary races and plugs in a much bigger n that we are going to have a problem with. It's out of bounds. Then we use it because we think, oh, we checked it. Now we have a problem because we've used a, some value that we didn't actually validate because of this race condition. This make sense? So this is the double fetch problem that these guys are worried about in their paper. And uh, any questions about these guys? All right. So the reason I'm going through them is actually I think a, like a good chunk of the value of this paper is just sort of appreciating various ways you could do this wrong so that when you guys go write some interface, you have them in mind and don't fall for the same pitfalls. And then, of course, you know, the other half is the tricks they have for how to think about the interface so you have a more systematic plan for catching them. All right. And the next two issues I want to mention in the paper all have to do with callbacks. So the issue for callbacks for them is that often the way that callbacks are set up or the way that these library interfaces work is that the application wants to invoke, let's say, this JPEG decoder, the library here, but the library needs to be told, here's where you get the data from in order to decode. Here's how you skip more bytes on the input. Here's how you interact with the environment. And typically that's provided by supplying a whole bunch of callback functions for the library to use. So there might be a struct that the application defines that has a callback function that the library is expected to invoke. And this callback might be some other function in the application itself, like read callback. Like here's a function that the library should call if it needs more data. So then you pass the struct over to the library, and the library needs to call read CB in order to, you know, invoke get more data. How does it call it? It shouldn't be allowed to call arbitrary functions in the application code. That would be disastrous because you can call system calls, you can call who knows what. But we need to explicitly delineate these functions, which are not so explicitly specified in these existing library APIs. So we need to know what callbacks are valid. Not a good idea to allow arbitrary callbacks, of course, because then you just jump to whatever code you want. And uh, another sort of related problem is that it might be that even though the set of callbacks is known, if we somehow figure out what callbacks are allowed, might not be always allowed. So it might also be a separate question of when is a callback allowed. So it might be that certain callbacks are only valid after you've done something else. Like you have to first call the open a file callback, then you can read from it. And if you just call read without opening first, you know, the application code is going to crash because it doesn't, assumes that doesn't happen. Make sense? These are tricky issues that they're trying to deal with here at the interface boundary. And maybe the last state, the last sort of uh, example I want to talk to you guys about is the state associated with callbacks that turns out to also be somewhat tricky for them to deal with. So in terms of callback state, the way these callbacks often work is that the library might be doing work on behalf of many invocations. So maybe you're calling the JPEG library to decode multiple JPEG things at the same time. 
So in the application, you might actually have multiple objects, like maybe here's a network connection for one JPEG image that you're trying to decode. Here's another network connection. These are sort of, you know, some object in memory representing a network connection. And the read callback fo function in the application takes a, a connection parameter that specifies which connection it should read from. And the library is typically expected to invoke the callback with the right argument, like maybe this argument or this argument. And again, there's a problem of you need to allow something to happen, but which one? So like, what arguments are actually going to be allowed for any given callback? And more annoyingly for them, these arguments might also be thread dependent. So you might actually have Firefox running many threads trying to decode data from many network connections at the same time. And it's important that the JPEG decoder on each thread is accessing the connection for that thread's network state. And if the library supplies the wrong network connection to the wrong thread, you might have race conditions, might have memory management errors, etc. So this might actually be not just what args are allowed in general, but also in a specific thread. All right. That makes sense? That's all the examples from the paper. I just sort of drew them out in this diagram form that maybe is, I don't know, a different way of looking at the same set of bugs. Any questions about roughly the kinds of issues these guys are going after? The problems they're worried about at this interface boundary? All make sense? All right. So what's the plan? How are we going to try to think sort of more systematically about this interface problem to figure out how to prevent this, uh, you know, th these class of security problems. So roughly, their plan for, I guess, securing the API, roughly speaking, is that they're really going to think about the data flow and control flow across this interface boundary, sort of this boundary that we have between the application and the library code we're going to try to find all the ways that data goes across this boundary and all the control flows going across this boundary. And we're going to force the developer to think about these cases. So we'll sort of have to present them to the developer. And the developer needs to look at them and decide when is this okay, when is this not okay. So this is slightly unsatisfactory because, as you can imagine, right, like this is not a solving the problem outright, it's just telling the developer, look here, look here, look here. Um, but according to them, it seems to be helpful because they, their experience seems to be that just finding these places is annoying enough because you might accidentally miss one and there's a security problem. So their plan of attack is to just get the developer to explicitly think about all the places where data is flowing from application to library and back and all the ways that you might have control flow going back and forth with callbacks or function calls and make sure that the developer does the, at least considers it. They don't necessarily have sort of universal solutions because in many ways, these properties that we're talking about, because they're interface properties, they're inherently interface specific. And the interface is very much tied to the app. So it's hard to do sort of general defenses for this kind of interface security problem. Uh, but it seems pretty fruitful what they're doing to just pin, pinpoint for the developer where the sort of security critical steps are. Does that make sense? Another cool thing that's going on for there is that they're actually doing this all at compile time, which is seems like a good plan for uh, getting the developer to pay attention or flag all these cases. So they're not really a user-facing tool. Like you, as an end user of a browser, you wouldn't really use this. It's really all about the developer uh, being able to set up this interface correctly and wrap it up correctly. 
Uh, and their focus on compile time checks seems to be a pretty good idea in general for getting the developer to catch all the different places. And one reason compile time techniques actually work pretty well for security in general is because they're not relying on any particular workload or tests. So if you're doing runtime checking, you'd have to have exhaustive tests that cover everything that could happen on the interface boundary. And one really nice thing about doing this at compile time is that the compiler will check all the possible things that could happen if you set up the compile checks correctly, like they do in the paper. Uh, the compiler is going to catch all the cases for you, even if you never actually run them in any particular test. So compile time checks, really good idea for security in general. That makes sense? Questions? Yeah. How much these guys slow down the compile time? Sorry? Yeah, so they don't really report this. C++ compilers are, or were at least, kind of notorious for having really long compile times. And they use templates, which is one of the big sources of compile time overhead in compilers. So I imagine if you have a heavy use of RLbox, your compilation time might indeed increase noticeably. But the reason they don't actually really report this in the paper is because my guess is that it's like not a huge amount. It's not taking them hours all of a sudden to compile. And it has absolutely no effect on the resulting code, of course, because it's purely compile time. So the code generated is still the same code you would have generated. Um, and I guess as long as it's not taking the you know, huge amount of time to compile because of it, they don't really report it, but, you know, good thing to worry about. Um, they're thinking probably an acceptable thing. Other questions? Okay, so let's look at the specific ideas they have for how to track data flow and control flow across this boundary. So the main plan for them is this idea of tainted data types. So in order to get the compiler to help them track data flow across a boundary, they make use of effectively sort of, well, templates, which they use kind of like a polymorphic data type in C++, where in the application code, normally you might have sort of simple types like ints or bools, or you might have some kind of a pointer like a char star, or you might have some struct. And they introduce a tainted type, which you can apply sort of with the syntax tainted with angle brackets on subtype T, where T might be any one of these things. So you might have a tainted int, tainted char star, tainted struct foo, etc. And the plan is to use the tainted type to enforce checks on the data flow between the app and the library. So on the library side, every time you invoke the library, everything going to the library must be a tainted T type of some kind. Doesn't really matter what the T is, must be tainted. And then everything coming back from the library is also of a tainted data type. So we'll talk in a second how you convert between them back and forth, but you could imagine how this is gonna now help us deal with this problem of ensuring that all the data going to the library is approved to send to the library. You don't accidentally send some sensitive data if you can prevent the sensitive data from turning into a tainted type. And similarly, all the tainted data coming back from the library is gonna be tainted, which is gonna require the developer to pay attention before they turn into a regular type and use it in some way that might matter in the application. So this tainted sort of reflects whether the, we're talking about data that's good on the left or suspect on the right. Make sense? Hopefully, fairly simple intuition. But this kind of sort of tracking of where data is coming from or whether data needs more careful attention is pretty prevalently used in a bunch of systems. So these guys use the C++ template hack to do this in C++ in the browser. Linux kernel actually has something kind of similar for tracking user pointers as well. 
a similar kind of a problem in Linux in the kernel code to what these guys worry about in the browser is that the kernel might accidentally access a user supplied pointer without checking that it's a valid pointer first. Very much like the problem that these guys worry about with pointers being passed back and forth. So this problem of sort of pointers being sent from user space to the kernel in Linux is exactly the same problem as this. And that's actually one of the pretty common sources of how you might actually compromise the kernel in a Linux machine. Those bugs used to be much more common than they are now, partly because the Linux kernel implemented a similar scheme, kind of like this tainted pointer tracking, tainted type tracking system that uh, these guys have here. So what are the rules? How, how, how is this tainting of types helping them? So the way to think of it is, in terms of operations you can do on tainted data and how data changes from different types, data or types. So for regular things, so for simple types, I guess, things like ints or bools, if you just want to convert it to a tainted value, what are the rules? When can you convert an int to a tainted int for them? Do they care? No, so yeah, anytime. So there basically is no check. And that's sort of their assumption that you don't really store secrets in ints themselves, partly because the only kind of secret they're really worried about is ASLR leaks. Uh, but indeed, for simple data types, they just say, ah, oh, you can convert to a tainted int, no problem. But then going back, that's a different deal. So if you want to get a regular int from a tainted int, well, you've got to run one of these validation functions. So you have to somehow check that this tainted int looks good enough for your use case before the compiler will let you convert it into a regular int. And to a first approximation, you can't really use a tainted int like an int at all. You can't check if it's equal to zero, you can't check if it's greater than something else, etc. There are some funny exceptions, but it's sort of a little bit of a distraction. So does this make sense? So by forcing data coming from the library back to the application to be of type tainted int, then it's gonna force the developer to write some kind of a validation check before they get a regular int out. And this is gonna address the status problem for us. So we were worried that maybe the library sends back some bogus status that the application doesn't handle. Well, it's not gonna be an int, it's gonna be a tainted int. And the application developer hopefully sees that and says, aha, well, let me validate it. The only things that are allowed are these two or three status codes. And I'll put that in my validator. And then if the library sends something bogus to me, I'll just stop instead of proceeding to use a bad status. Make sense? So that's one part of the plan for them. Similarly, for pointers, um, they also have rules for sort of going from char star to tainted char star and back. So what has to happen? If I got a char star in my application, how do I get a tainted char star to pass it to the library? What needs to happen? Guesses, yeah? Yeah, so you probably, in order to, if I have a pointer in my application, then probably first I need to allocate some memory in the sandbox and then copy into that memory location. Or maybe I already have it pre allocated in some way, but uh, I need to figure out where the data is going to go and copy it. Then I'm sent over here. And then on the way back, if I want to go back to a char star here, then similarly I need to or the type system for the tainted char, it, again, doesn't really allow me to do anything interesting with this tainted thing, but in order to get a re real char star out, I need to do a validation pass on it, and as part of it, probably I'll need to copy the data back into my address space. Make sense? Question? Sorry? So the sandbox for them, I think they're not using it in any mode that allows shared memory. So one of the sandbox types they actually support is just running the codec in a separate process without setting up any shared memory in the operating system between these two processes. So they're just totally different address spaces, no sharing between them. And in fact, uh, well, they can probably reduce some overheads if they set up this sharing. Um, 
you know, maybe you can figure out some way to share a pointer into WebAssembly. Like, I'm sure you could. Uh, but I think for them, they're maybe thinking, well, it's actually kind of risky. Maybe they'll be forced to do it to reduce their overheads. But directly accessing memory in the sandbox carries with the risks of those kind of double fetch bugs. So they want to really be very explicit when you're copying data because it's sometimes important to copy once. It's kind of risky to keep accessing pointers into the sandbox. One thing, yeah, question back there. Ah, good question, yeah. So, right, so this is exactly tr we're trying to prevent this issue we we're talking about here. So how does this happen? Well, the only thing you're allowed to pass to the library is a tainted bracket something. The only kind of a pointer you can pass is a tainted char star. The only way you get this out from a char star is by allocating a new thing inside of the sandbox, which is not using your ASLR, it's using the sandbox address space. And then you can copy into that buffer, but then the pointer that's going to get passed in is the thing you allocated inside the sandbox, not your pointer. So there's just no way that the type system is going to allow you to pass this literal pointer in. It'll force you to allocate a new pointer and pass that in. So that solves this ASLR problem we were talking about. And then on the path back, the fact that you can just use this tainted char star as a pointer, you're forced to validate and copy it, is solving this other problem for us of sort of arbitrary memory rights on the return path from the library to the application. Because the type system prevents me from ever dereferencing a pointer that came directly from the library. It's a tainted pointer. The only thing I can do with it is validate and copy. I can't dereference it by the C++ type system. Make sense? Question? Can the app learn about the library, you're asking? Yep. Yeah, so that's a good question. Okay, so like, you know, we are so worried about the app. What about the poor library? Yeah, it's like, you know, the, the app could potentially learn something about this guy. So I think you're right in general, right? Like, if this was a concern, then they're not quite solving it, maybe, in some ways. Um, in their case, the library is just completely a subset of the trust of the overarching app. So for them, the renderer process is in charge of everything. If the renderer process wants that pointer, fine. Uh, the only sort of thing we're worried about there is the renderer process shouldn't get confused because it looks at the app, at the library, I'm sorry. But in other contexts, you're absolutely right that you actually want protection both ways, potentially. So in Linux kernel, when the Linux kernel is looking at a user-supplied pointer, you want to make sure you sort of sanitize it, and then the other direction, you also want to not leak it potentially. So, you know, d depending on the exact context in which you're worrying about this interface boundary, the particular maybe rules for converting between the two sides would differ. So I think you're absolutely right. And it might be that you would actually have these rules happening on both sides. So one way to see what's going on in RL box is that RL box is really all happening on the application side. It's all here. The library is sort of uh, pretty much the same as it ever was. Nothing really changes in the library. But if you had really mutually distrustful components, then you would probably have something like RL box on the application side, making sure the application is correctly using the API, safely using the API. And then the library would have another something like RL box on its front end as well, making sure that the calls it's getting aren't going to get misinterpreted. So the reason this doesn't show up in this paper is because they're not mutually distrustful. The app doesn't trust the library, but the library does trust the app. In other contexts, like if you're just doing RPC between servers, you probably want something morally like RL box on actually both sides of this interface. Absolutely. Other questions? All right, so we talked about type conversions for sort of simple values, we talked about type conversions for pointers. They also have some rules for structs. So if you have some kind of a struct foo, then you can convert that guy into a tainted struct foo. The rule here is actually, in order to convert the struct, you basically have to convert all the fields. 
So if your struct consists of a whole bunch of ints, then there's no check for converting a struct full of ints to a tainted struct full of ints. But if your struct contains a char star, well, there you have to use this rule to convert the char star field of your struct, then you can do the rest of it. So that's roughly the plan. The way to think of it is that the rule for converting a whole struct is the sort of rules for all the individual members. The paper is a little bit squishy on exactly how they handle structs. As far as I can tell, they don't quite handle them in a generic way, sort of as a limitation of C++'s type system for in templates. Um, I think they have some program you might be able to run on the side that looks at the definition of a struct and then prints out, here's like the C++ template code you should have for handling all the struct fields. So it's a little bit outside of the template system. But morally, the way you should think of it is that you want this tainting, taint checking to make sure that this conversion is allowed for all the fields in order to allow the conversion. Make sense? Question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, suppose you have a super nested struct, like a struct foo has like two struct bars and those have other structs inside of them. I think morally what you want to happen is that indeed the compiler just goes recursively down and checks that all of them are convertible into tainted types because otherwise this rule, this plan is going to fall apart. Now, as far as I can tell, their prototype is kind of weak in terms of structs. I don't think they actually handle nested structs in the way that we're talking about here. But in other type systems, like if you have a fancier language like Haskell or something, uh, you might be able to implement that kind of recursive uh, walking down the definition of a type uh, and checking some kind of a conversion rule. Um. I'm sorry? Yeah, so okay, so for C++ objects, things are a little bit trickier. So you're asking like, you know, a C++ object has both fields and pointers, like on methods on an object. So I think C++ objects are a messy thing. So they don't deal with objects with method calls. You can't actually pass a C++ object across their interface boundary, partly because the security implications are kind of fuzzy. Like if you pass an object, does this mean you're passing all the methods that the object has, or are you intending for the library to call only some of the methods, only the public methods in C++, not the protected or private methods, all kind of hard questions to answer. So in their world, they basically treat this interface as a much simpler thing where you can just send memory pointers and explicit callbacks. So method calls on an object are not really a thing they do. You will actually see in more fancy RPC systems, like Microsoft has this DCOM system, you can actually send sort of objects, so to say, with method calls. Someone can call methods on it. And that's being a security problem because you, know, you might accidentally send an object with too many methods that are allowed to call on it, et cetera. Uh, so I think there's really a trade-off between how much power you can uh, automatically give the programmer by passing an object and giving all the methods on it versus sort of security and explicitness. Java is another example where you can just pass an object and you pass all the methods that can be invoked on it and uh, source of a number of security bugs in Java systems like this. Make sense? All right. So similar rules apply going back is that, you know, if you want to convert a back to a struct foo, you'll have to sort of satisfy all the decoding rules, which probably means validation for every field plus more, uh, you know, copying pointers if need be. So that's what's going on with their tainted data types. Question. Uh, how do you know how many bytes to copy here? On both sides. So here it's actually up to the application developer. So the way this happens is that in order to convert a char star to a tainted char star, you write a little piece of code. And then in that code, you need to call probably like strlen on this char star, allocate that, that many plus one bytes here, string copy them. Same on the way back, you like call strlen on the data in the sandbox, allocate that many bytes, etc. So this is really, you know, you could do maybe more automation and in a different language or with more effort, you could do, do this. They're really just focused on sort of catch the places where the developer should look. And, you know, of course, the develop they probably could give the developer more help on this. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, okay, so your question is, okay, unions. Union is a, I don't know. I think from a security perspective, unions are probably a misfeature of the C-type system. Shouldn't send unions over <laughs> RPC interfaces. Uh, it's not even clear what a union means necessarily, unambiguously. So typically not a thing you would probably want to do directly. Uh, yeah, you, you could probably figure out some rules that would kind of work, but I'm not sure it's worth the effort. You should probably just not use a union. I don't know. I guess they got lucky their libraries don't use unions. Maybe that's the answer. Yeah. Makes sense. Other questions about this tainted type handling process? All right, so let's look at a couple of other you know, techniques they have in their design and how this solves the problems we talked about. So the next sort of clever trick they have is this notion of freezing. So this is trying to address the double access bugs. So the idea is that in an application, you might have uh, some kind of a struct pointer to memory in the library. So you might have this you know, struct foo pointer into, into library memory. And if you try to access different fields in this tainted struct, you can actually access them individually. So one thing I guess I didn't specify in these operations is the rules for when you're allowed to descend down into a struct. So if I have a struct foo, one thing I can do is actually ask for just one field of foo. So I can struct, you know, ask for foo.x or foo.y here, and I think uh, RL box will let me ask for a particular field of a struct foo uh, and access just that part of the memory in the library's address space. So here I might have x and y in this memory. So in order to prevent double access bugs to various fields of the struct, what they do is actually they have a, effectively a new template type called freezable. You can think of it. I think it's actually like a variant of tainted, but you can think of it as freezable struct foo star. And you're not actually allowed to touch a freezable struct foo star. You just need to treat it as an opaque pointer. You can keep passing it around. And as soon as you're ready to make a check, you have to call, you know, suppose this is P, it's a freezable thing. Then you can actually assign it to Q, where Q is P.freeze. And the type you get back is now not a freezable, but a frozen foo star. And the difference is that now freeze copies the whole structure over to the application side, avoiding that double access bug we were talking about on the left side. And now, once you have a frozen type of a thing, then you can actually access all the fields in it just fine. Now, of course, you have to validate, but you're allowed to actually even try validating them. Whereas when you have a freezable thing, you're not allowed to even start validating until you call freeze. Questions on this plan? Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, so yeah, your question is, okay, you're correctly recalling what the bug was, is that the library changes the memory contents. What happens is that p.freeze will actually copy the whole struct over here into the application's memory, x and y, one time. So freeze is basically a copy of the whole struct. Now that you've copied it, the library can change it all fine, but you're going to look at a consistent snapshot. And... You might look at a snapshot that was after the library corrupted state or before, but the important point is that the check that you're going to now do on some field of this frozen struct is going to be atomic with respect to the subsequent use of it. So either you'll have a good value, you, the check will pass and then you'll use it, or you'll have a bad value, the check will fail, and you will not use it. So I think maybe the thing I forgot to mention here, make explicit, is that freeze makes a copy of the whole struct in the application's memory space so that now the library can't change the state seen by the application between those two operations. Make sense? Other questions? All right. So that's sort of the freezing trick they have. And then they have a nice solution for handling callbacks as well, where for callbacks, their plan is to effectively... Well, there's sort of two things going on with callbacks. One is that they need to answer the question of which callbacks are legit to invoke at any given point. So what they do is that they define a 
trampoline function in the application. So the application is going to supply the library with exactly one thing it can ever call back. And let's call it the RL box underscore trampoline. And it really takes just two arguments. You can give it the ID of the function you'd like to invoke and the arguments. And what it does, what this trampoline function does, is it looks at a table of all the registered callbacks in the application. So if you want to allow the library to call back into the application code, you're going to have to call register callback as the application developer. And you're going to have to tell RLBox, here's the exact function I want the library to be able to invoke. And then RLBox is going to stick your callback into the slot, and it's going to say, oh, yeah, you now have a callback. The underlying value is just going to be the slot index, like slot number one. That's your callback. So now when the trampoline call comes and the application says, I want to call function one, RLBox knows what to call. There's two cool things going on here. One is that by registering them in a table, you can now explicitly list the things that are allowed, and you can remove them. So if the application says, oh, now the, you can no longer invoke this callback, you can just say unregister CB, and you can remove that slot. So now you can prevent the, the library from being able to invoke this callback later. The other cool thing is actually use type signatures on the callback to enforce the data flow discipline. So they basically say that every callback must be of the following type format. It must be a callback that takes a bunch of tainted arguments and must return a tainted result. Slightly sloppy with my C++ syntax here, but the idea is that in the register CB type signature, the callback that you must register must promise to accept only tainted arguments and must produce a tainted output. And this ensures that whatever callback you register is going to follow these rules for having to validate all the data coming in, and it must encode the data going out so that it follows the data flow discipline that we've tried to set up. This makes sense? So it's kind of a cute, you know, language level set of tricks to help the developer follow this discipline. Now, the C++ details aren't super important, but the same ideas often come up. So I guess to sort of summarize what's going on here, it's like really an important problem to think about the security of interfaces between isolated components once you've got them actually isolated from each other. And the way this paper proposes thinking about it in terms of securing data flows and control flows turns out to be a pretty profitable idea. Their C++ hacks are cool and all, but probably you can do similar hacks in any other language as well if you think hard. But this does turn out to be a profitable plan. Another thing is, I guess, this was an interesting case study of how to privilege separate client-side web browsers, which is a real problem as well. All right, any other questions? Cool. That's all we had for RLBox. Let's talk about iOS and smartphone security next week. See you guys then.